Well, first of all, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Appreciate the invitation extended by Mike Belsky and the entire trade association. Um, it's always fun to come and, and talk about what's next, and I sort of racked my brain about what, what we could talk about today, and I thought most of you in the room uh, generate your livelihood off of wireless infrastructure. So I thought what we could talk about a little bit today is some of the things that we're seeing and some of the trends that we're seeing out there and how that's going to play out over the next few years and how it's going to impact everybody in the room. And I think that's a good topic of discussion. And I'll try to move through it quickly because some of the data is a bit, is a bit rich in numbers, and I'd rather uh, sort of expend the last bit of time taking questions if there are any. So let's, uh, let's see if we can get right into this. Hold on one second if I can. The disclaimer, very important. If you all can read that really quickly, you're much smarter than I am. <laughs> it means everything I say is complete bullshit. No kidding. Um, so, <laughs> those of you really know me, see? Okay. So, let, let's talk about the current state of where we are as an industry today. And I, I talked about wireless infrastructure as being kind of a, a general industry. And if you think about where we've come in 20 years, it, it's a big industry because it has a lot of different components to it. And so, we talk a lot about the ecosystem of what is wireless infrastructure today. And there's sort of five kind of key categories that touch everything that we do in this room today. You know, first and foremost is macro sites. Everybody loves towers. That's good. Small cell and DAS. We've got small cell Wi-Fi. I'm going to talk a little bit about that today because there's been a lot of discussion in the last few weeks about what is, what is Wi-Fi, how does it play into future network deployments, and will it take anything away from what we're doing in this room. Fiber to the cell, big, big business today, growing very, very fast, and data centers. Ultimately, we're you know, the, the, uh, the uh, information ends up. So from call origination to where we end up, we, we have all these touch points across the system. So all parts of this ecosystem, as you can probably guess and imagine, are doing pretty well. Uh, it's a good place to be today. Each of these asset classes are, are very unique. They face different challenges. But one thing is very consistent across all five of these asset classes. They have access to capital. Investors really like these five asset classes right now. So when we think about it, we talk about there's public equity and there's private equity. Private equity right now is spending an inordinate amount of time on small cell, fiber to the cell, and a little bit of time around Wi-Fi, but a lot of time around data centers. There's a lot of private equity money chasing, chasing the data center sector space. Uh, private equity has begun to move away from towers. Uh, they feel that the IRRs aren't there anymore. As the business has become more mature, pricing has been more marginalized, and the, the bigger get bigger and the smaller guys get smaller. So private equity typically moves away from that. And what they're finding is in these other four asset classes, there's smaller opportunities where they can achieve higher alpha and better returns. Credit markets on the debt side of the balance sheet, very open to all five asset classes. The least in favor right now is probably Wi-Fi. The only financeable opportunity for the small Wi-Fi guys right now is really mezzanine capital or private capital. Most of the big institutional lenders will not give money to Wi-Fi operators today. But what we do find is that, unlike the equity side, the debt investors really favor towers. Towers continues to be a protected asset class for debt investors. So we see a lot of capital moving, particularly from insurance companies and pension funds, backing the public guys and the big private guys. So that's a very robust side of the marketplace today. Data centers continue to enjoy uh, another, that's another sort of favored asset class where you see a lot of ABS and CMBS. Data centers are predominantly REITs. Uh, as such, they're real estate classes, and CMBS is the preferred methodology for financing that type of debt. It's good to be a REIT. Um, American blazed the trail, Crown and SBA are right behind them. Uh, Vertical Bridge is a private REIT. The, the REIT structure, if you're going to own these assets for a long time, is the preferred methodology for not only public investors, but also for private investors as well. So very, very healthy. I think the picture I wanted to paint here is that the current state of play is a healthy one and capital remains you know, very robust and, and, and very abundant. So why do we all love towers? Just a little history class in case any of you have forgotten why you love the tower business so much. Uh, from an investor side, they love barriers to entry. So to the extent that you can build unique locations where you have unique relationships with carriers, you're rewarded for that. Revenue visibility. We talked about that debt side of the balance sheet and why investors really love towers on the debt side. They like the visibility. They like the long-term contracted natures of the cash flows, and they love the fact that 99% of the time your customer renews. That's pretty good. Churn less than 90 basis points to 110 basis points is a good, good place to be. Growth and demand. We're going to talk about the demand drivers in a second, but the, 
underlying fundamental macro drivers, the consumer level drivers of towers today are fundamentally sound and strong. Operating leverage, to the extent that you can build a big portfolio, to the extent that you can monetize your ground lease, to the extent you can get good vendor relationships with your insurance provider, your site maintenance provider, your lighting provider, you get what's called operating leverage. And so therefore, if your operating costs are fixed, every incremental dollar you put on the tower is incremental cash flow. Then that begins to replicate itself as you get to 50 towers, 100 towers, 2,000 towers, 40,000 towers. The more scale you get, the more operating leverage you get. Margins become better. Investors like that. So why, what, what's going on? What are the drivers? There's a couple of things that I want to talk about. One is we, we, we've talked about this global demand in mobile data. And that is no more pronounced than it is in the United States today. If you think about what's happening at the consumer level, I always tell people exhibit A of what's going on in the United States today is my 15-year-old daughter. She is the poster child of why it's good to be in this business. She carries two devices. She's got her iPad. She's got her smartphone. She no longer hangs out in the TV room. That's not cool, Dad. She hangs out in her room. She downloads Netflix. She gets the content that she wants. She watches it when she wants to watch it. Her iPad sits in a docking station all day long. While she's off at school, it's downloading the content she wants. She's killing the network. Um, and she's killing my credit card. Um, and at the same time, she's at school and she's mobile and she's on all the social media applications. And this is the modern age young adult today in the United States. They carry two devices. By average, they're on three social media platforms. And most of them are subscribing to their content on Netflix or some other form of wireless type of entertainment where we can download our content. This is the future of what's happening in networks. The reality is we morphed from feature phones to smartphones to now tablets. Tablets will ultimately become, they'll be a hybrid between a smartphone and a tablet, and that's the way you'll do all of your commerce, whether it's work, banking, paying bills, going to Starbucks, or downloading a movie, that's the future. One device with you, ubiquitous coverage, where you do all of your, not only your consumer needs, but you can also do your work needs. So where are we as a penetration rate as a country? We finally have reached the, the vaunted 100%. I remember five years ago, we were sitting at a wireless show, and we were still at 94, 96%. We're now at 104%. But believe it or not, we still lag. We're still a laggard to Norway, Korea, and Japan, which is sort of shocking. But the reality is today, consumers are now carrying, on average, two wireless devices. And we think this penetration rate is low. We think this can go all the way to 135 to 140% as a country. So where, where are the real demand drivers? If we start dissecting this sort of what, what AT&T called seven years ago, the mobile data tsunami, uh, there's a couple things we look at. You know, one is where are the connections? The connections between smartphones and feature phones. So if you look on the lower, uh, lower left-hand side there, and you see that chart, and where we are today is 32% of the devices that are connected today are only smartphones. So non-smartphone devices are 68%. So we still have a long ways to go in terms of getting consumers to use smartphones, which is sort of shocking. Everyone in this room uses a smartphone. We are not the norm because we're in the wireless industry. The rest of America, believe it or not, is still using feature phones. A lot of folks are still using feature phones. So then we think about consumption. And when we looked at this slide five years ago, we were talking about terabytes. Now we're talking about exabytes. So think about that. Just the quantum has changed from what the definition is. And if you think about that growth rate, we're talking about growth rate that at one point was 10x, now it's sort of at 3 to 4x. But these are, we're talking about growth rates that were measured in 1,000%, 300%, 200% over the last trailing seven to eight years. This is explosive growth when you think about where consumers are spending their time and how they're consuming minutes of use on the network, because that's where really we're going to get to here. Data consumption off the hook. This is my daughter's con contribution to this presentation. Um, so once again, we're talking about what is the real demand in terms of mobile, mobile data traffic today. We talked about five years ago, this demand was multiplying at 1,000%, two, 300%. The knitting is still pretty good here. I mean, that's the punchline. 61% CAGR growth from 13 to 18. Last year, we did about 57% growth in this country and sustainable growth over the next three to four years. There's no end in sight in terms of how much consumption is coming and what are the pressures on the network. 
So what's next? Besides smartphones, we talked about feature phones, we've talked about tablets. What are some of the things that we're thinking about that we think will change and modify consumer behavior and modify how we build networks? Uh, the first segment that we're talking a lot about now is wearables. So what's a wearable? A wearable is a smartphone, uh, sorry, smartwatch, health and fitness trackers. I don't know how many people in the room have these fitness bands that track how much your activity is. These are significant, significant opportunities and they consume data on the network. This is really what we call M to M connections, machine to machine. Beyond that, we also have smart grid. We've got other types of retail, type of tracking software, how you're spending money, where you're moving. All of these things today are connections that do not involve the two of us communicating. These are connections that revolve around machine to machine. This is actually kind of the scariest part of the growth of where wireless is headed. So when we think about what wearables will do to the industry, we're talking about 105% growth in wearables. That's a pretty significant amount of demand. Um, no surprise, uh, the gluttonous country of the United States of America leads the uh, marketplace in wearables. Uh, we're the leader in that marketplace and we'll have 60 million users using wearables by 2018. The real big driver in the consumer of traffic on the network today is video. We talked about my daughter downloading Netflix in her room it's beyond that. It's beyond just downloading. It's live stream. It's live music. All of these things are massive, massive headaches for RF engineers and people running the networks today. We're really in early days is sort of one of the thematics that we think about today. And we think this will be the major driver of traffic on the networks come three to four years from now. So as we look at that chart on the right hand side in the bottom there, and you look out to 2018, more than 50% almost 60%, what is that, 60, close to 69%, if you can read that, will be data. That's where the consumption, the MOUs will be on the network. And we think about how networks are getting congested and how people are consuming. So another key thing is this concept of, and you heard it from our friends that the, uh, the technical guy before me, his presentation was really good, a little over my head, but one of the things we talk about is a spreading out effect. So it used to be that the top 1% used 50% or more of the mobile data capacity in a network. You know, today that's beginning to spread out, which means that more of the users on the network are spreading out the usage of mobile data across the entire network. So when you think about where we are, where we ended in 13, we don't have this data updated for 14, but really 10% of mobile data traffic, 10% of the, uh, of the top users are now using more than 50% of the network, where it used to be the 1% was using 52%, the top 1% is using 10%, sorry. And the other thing we have is this peak to average ratio that he talked about before. So peak to average is you get spikes in the network. And typically, if you look out in the suburbs, that spike was early in the morning, and it was sort of after 5.30. And in the urban core, it was sort of from 9.30 to 3.30. Now what's happening is that spreading out is widening. It's widening in the suburbs, and it's widening in the urban core as people take their tablets to work with them, or as people leave their tablets at home and they're downloading content while they leave the house. Or if they go to lunch, they download content in their office. So now what we have is a spreading out effect. In the busy hour traffic, we're consuming more during the busy hour traffic, but also in our average hour traffic, which is the normal daytime period, you see that there's been a double in consumption predicted over the next three to four years. So it's no longer this, this, this notion, now the, the problem for RF engineers is now double compounded because they were dealing with peak busy hours, but now what they're finding is this is spreading out, and there's no, really no such thing as a peak usage hour. Peak is 24-7 now for the carriers. So, what does this mean? The prospects are pretty dizzying for this industry. Uh, if we really had no impact of improving spectral efficiency, if we don't have more spectrum, and we don't have improvements in device technology, we go from having 300,000 cell sites in the United States today to needing 4.3 million macro sites. 4.3 million macro sites. That would be a real problem. Uh, we wouldn't be able to fill that demand. So, what's the solution? The solution is, you know, we, we talk a lot to investors and we talk to uh, analysts in Wall Street, and they're all eager to get that, what we call the single bullet solution. The reality is there is no single bullet. You actually need all three things to happen at the same time. You need new spectrum. We just had some spectrum auctions and you saw the carriers paid ridiculous numbers for spectrum. Why? 
because they need it badly, because they don't want to go build 4.3 million cell sites. Um, we need spectral efficiency. We need the radios to work at a more efficient pace where we can download more information in a finite amount of spectrum in a quicker period of time. He talked about it earlier before, this concept of latency. Very important. And we need new sites. There still is no better solution for increasing your coverage and capacity by refortifying the network. And we'll talk about some of the different site solutions that are out there. But the key here is you need all three of these things to happen simultaneously for the industry to keep going. So let's talk about new spectrum. Where's Tom Wheeler and when we need him? So there's a couple of different bands that we think about. Obviously, you've got AWS3 that's come up. We've got the digital TV refarming, and then we've got incremental federal spectrum. So there's about 220 megahertz available today for the carriers to go out and get over the next five years. We have the spectrum. We have the government now very efficiently auctioning that spectrum off. So we believe the spectrum issue is solved. We think it'll be solved, as long as the carriers can pay for it. Second on speed dial is Bell Labs, right? We gotta figure out how to make the radios work better. At, when we think about the peak bandwidth per five megahertz, you can see the efficiencies that you gain from moving to 4G to LTE plus. Significant gains in radio technology improvement. This is very important to the evolution of networks today. And then spectral efficiency. Um, we need to be able to move consumers up the value chain. And so this is why you see most of the carriers offering you a great deal to move into that new phone or move into that new tablet. This is a significant playbook issue for the carriers. They want to move you up the value chain. Very important. The faster they can move you up, the more they can free up some of the additional spectrum and they can move other types of technologies that don't require as much bandwidth onto other types of devices. So this is, a, this is a definite strategy the carriers are implementing, and there's significant financial incentives to move us as consumers up that value chain. So the reality is, if you've got a better device, plus it's faster, equals more usage. You spend more time on the network. It's really simple. You don't even know it, and you're spending more time on the network. So the reality is, you know, when we think about peak demands today, they're higher for new technologies. The reality is, if you have a better device, and you're using more of that device, whether it's for your own banking uses or if it's for your entertainment use or it's for work, the reality is if you're using a newer device and it has a better radio, it is going to make you spend more time on the network and you're going to use more MOUs. This is a problem for the carriers. So then comes small cell. What's all the fuss around small cell? Well, our belief is that it's a necessary solution. Um, it is one of many solutions that the carriers can deploy today. And if you think about this, you know, DAS is a lower cost solution than macro cells when you think about what it costs to activate a DAS node versus what it costs to build a macro site. To build a tower costs $300,000. The carrier spends another $150,000 in electronics. That's a pretty expensive proposition for the carrier. On average, a DAS node can cost $35,000 to $40,000 to deploy. The challenge is, how many DAS nodes equals one macro tower? So when we think about the different portions of the network, we've got outside the cities, which is the low density area. We've got the suburbs, which is moderate density. And then we've got the urban core where you have heavy density. And so the equation of you know, DAS nodes to tower varies based on the topography, based on the geography, based on the pops, and so what we get is typically in a macro environment where you're in the rural areas, typically you won't see a lot of DAS deployments. The macro cell continues to be the most efficient solution. Where you really begin to see this battle start taking place is really in the suburbs, where you've got difficult zoning, difficult topography, and you've got different usage patterns by the consumers. And so here what you see is a sort of an exchange ratio of what we would call in the burbs somewhere in the seven to one range. Seven DAS nodes to one macro tower. Then we get into the urban core, the landscape completely changes. You could go into a million square foot office building in New York City, and you may have 20 DAS nodes in a building of that size. Where there, the equation would be 20 DAS nodes to one macro site. And even that one macro may not be able to serve that entire million square foot office building because we've got different types of construction materials, different types of heights, different types of walls. There's all kinds of considerations that go into making the network perform in the urban core. 
So what's the reality? Um, this is the reality in a lab, in a perfect environment, 68 degrees, environmentally controlled, somewhere in Paramus, New Jersey. This is the reality of today, which is you have networks that have a combination of macrocytes and small cells, and the two coexisting peacefully together, which means lots of opportunity for everyone in this room. So if you think about what the, we talk about the macro overlay, and then we talk about what are called underlays. So those of you that are familiar with RF engineering, an underlay is when you have a problem spot in the network. We're at peak usage hours, a lot of users get onto the network, and that macro site gets, starts to shrink as we add more traffic, more users, and more MOUs at the same time. And so the solution, an underlay solution, is potentially three outdoor DAS nodes, potentially a Wi-Fi offload spot. There are multiple solutions that a carrier will use to deal with that issue. So that's an underlay. An underlay is where inside an existing macro site, you have a problem, and the solution is build a couple of small cells inside the macro. That works. Typically, that's a sports venue. Uh, typically, it's a shopping mall where you've got great macro sites surrounding the area, but once you get into the venue itself, you lose macro coverage, or macro coverage becomes constrained. The second concept is what we call fill-in. This is what you see in big cities today. We're seeing a lot of this activity right now. So what happens is network gets built, macros go up, load with subscribers, lots of traffic, lots of minutes of use. The original macro ring begins to shrink as usage goes up, and you get small holes, small holes in the network. Best way to fill those holes is through small cells. And there you've got three weapons at your discretion. You've got a small cell, a micro cell, which you can put on uh, any street pole, or you can put on the side of a building. You could use a Wi-Fi offload station, or you could use DAS nodes. The carriers literally have three, three different things that they can deploy in that type of situation. So the reality is there's all kinds of solutions to the problems that the carriers face today. So what about Wi-Fi offloading? This has been arguably, uh, you know, uh, when we go to talk to investors today, this is where investors' energy and attention is focused. So as you've heard, there's been a couple of carriers that are now using Wi-Fi to start. Google's been talking a lot about using Wi-Fi as the weapon of choice to avoid having to pay for spectrum and building tower sites. So what's the, what's the myth versus the reality? The reality is, fact one is, we already use Wi-Fi today. Everyone in this room uses Wi-Fi in their daily travels and in their daily consumption. Um, we're smart, we're sophisticated. When do we use it? We use it when we're downloading a lot of content or a lot of data or for live streaming or for choosing to download something on Netflix. The reality is, much of the bandwidth reduction from offloading, it's already happening today. And the reality is, for smartphone users, to continue to use that Wi-Fi and to use it on a mobile basis is literally impossible because most of the Wi-Fi locations that are set up are in place today. So when we think about where that average monthly mobile data usage is by network, and you think about the chart on the left, you know, the blue is cellular data, that's us mobile as consumers. The second is Wi-Fi at home, that's the biggest piece of the segment. Most of us use Wi-Fi at home, I believe, I hope. Um, and then we have Wi-Fi at work. So when you think about how we consume mobile data today, more than 60% of our usage of mobile data is already Wi-Fi. It's already there. So the impacts are manyfold. You know, Wi-Fi offloading has already taken a significant share of the traffic. So if Google thinks they're inventing something there, they're not. It exists today. They just would have to go out and build their own nodes. You know, all mobile devices are Wi-Fi enabled. Pretty easy to do. You toggle over, you switch over, and most of them are going to have the ability within two to three years to switch over automatically for you. The majority of that Wi-Fi usage happens in places where you're captive, home and at your office. But nothing will replace that journey between home and office or your leisure time over the weekend where you're still going to use a mobile device. And nothing, Wi-Fi cannot replace that at the end of the day. And the reality is most of our peak usage in data or video usage, that happens at home. And we're using Wi-Fi as that solution today. So Wi-Fi hotspots outside the home are relatively small. And the reality is that it is, one, a security issue. And two, there's a risk of how do you find real estate? How do you go out and continue to deploy the network and create more hotspots? It becomes expensive. 
So the reality is, you know, Wi-Fi offloading will only increase to 65% of mobile data traffic, where we see the average cellular data traffic still growing at that 50% rate that we talked about. So the truth is, both segments will continue to grow. And I think that's where a lot of the confusion comes in with investors today. Investors are always seeking, once again, that single bullet. They want to know that one thing is going to dominate over the other. The reality is Wi-Fi and mobile data need to work together to make networks work today. So I come back to the single bullet theory. There is no solve for the macro site. Um, you know, our view is in talking to carriers, like you guys talk to carriers, there still is a strong preference for a macro site to the extent that there's a coverage problem. Um, to the extent that small cell costs exceed budget or a small cell operator can't get into a venue or can't cover a geographic area, the carrier will always go back to the macro site. So what is the total market size as we think about shaping the opportunity set that's in this room over the next four to five years? You know, today there's about 310,000 sites in the United States. We believe that grows to 390,000 sites over the next three to four years. So we believe, our fundamental belief is, based on people that we hired to go out and research this for us is, there's about 80,000 macro sites that'll be built over the next four to five years. And that's a combination of de novo greenfield builds and co-locations. At the same time, we see small cell growing. Um, small cell ended last year roughly at about 25,000 small cells in the US. There's a belief that that'll grow you know, over 2x over the next three to four years. There's even a recent study that says small cell could actually grow by 5x. We could go from 27,000 small cells to 220,000 small cells over the next five years. So there is a lot of pinned up demand for small cell as carriers want to continue to bring the network indoors and closer to, this, the, to the consumer to reduce the latency between the handset and the antenna. So the punchline is, from my perspective is, both of these opportunities are real, and both of them are going to grow at a pretty good velocity. Um, so whether the path is choosing small cell or choosing macro sites, the, the reality is the knitting is going to be pretty good for the next three to four years. So where are our carrier partners headed? Um, relatively good news. Uh, we see an environment where all four carriers will deploy CapEx this year. If you think about that, the last time we had all four carriers deploying CapEx at the same time, with similar velocity, you got to go back to 1996-97. Because over the last 14 to 15 years that I've been in the business, one of these four guys has always been on the sidelines every year for, for a variety of reasons. And if you look across the four carriers that we deal with day to day, we see a pretty good environment. Uh, start with AT&T. We think AT&T will be a developer of sites and will continue to do business throughout this year. Project VIP has some, some limitations to it going forward, but we still think that AT&T will turn on their CapEx spigot sort of Q3 and Q4 this year, and it should be a very strong Q4 for AT&T. Um, Verizon will be probably the leader from our perspective this year in terms of total CapEx spend. I think they're, what they put out on the street was they're gonna spend 16 to 18 billion this year on infrastructure, uh, and recently noted that they'll spend an incremental uh, two billion on DAS and small cell. That was just out in their last pre press release. So, combination of macro and small cell. First time Verizon's publicly come out and said they're going to they're going to focus on small cell. Sprint. Uh, this is probably the best news to everyone in this room. Is Sprint's on the street? We believe there'll be somewhere between three to six thousand search rings active, if you haven't heard about it already, and projected somewhere to add somewhere between 15,000 to 20,000 macro sites and 20 to 25,000 small cell sites between now and 2019. Sprint has very, very aggressive plans uh, to strengthen their infrastructure. Um, T-Mobile's modernization program is almost complete. Um, the integration of Metro is already complete ahead of schedule. And we've already begun to see search rings hit the street for their former roaming overbuild plan, which was roughly about 12 to 1,800 sites. See some shaking heads, people agree with that. So those springs are out there. And the hope is that T-Mobile will continue to reinvest in the network and that Google signs a roaming agreement with them and crushes the network and they've got to add five to 10,000 macros over the next two years. <laughs> Everybody likes that. Okay, good. That's a good way to end. So that's our view. Um, I'm, I'm uh, delighted to be here, happy to answer questions, but uh, at least from, from my view where I sit, this is what's going on. These are, the, these are the trenches. These are the wars that are being fought in the trenches. And I think from, from my perspective as an investor and an owner of tower businesses and other infrastructure businesses, 
we think uh, this is a great place to be. So appreciate your time and thanks.